Hey YouTube, Electric Adventures here with the next episode of Let's Make a Retro Game. Um, this is the part two of um, our breakout having a little bit of more of a um, detailed look at the TMS 9918A graphics processor which is used in quite a few uh, computers around the time and obviously in our Coleco original SpectraView and MSX which is the target of the first section of this tutorial. Um, now uh, we will later on cover some of the other Z80s that don't have a dedicated um, graphics processor such as the Spectrum and the Amstrad uh, but first we need to finish off our game which is getting very close so this particular episode we're going to look at hardware sprites um, a feature that the TMS um, has on the other systems we need to simulate sprites with software now sprites are actually um, completely on top of the other graphics so you can see the little diagram that I've got up on the screen in uh, my reference word document here i will just go a little bigger for you guys and um, so the uh, the TMS chip is actually quite powerful it can actually accept an external VDP you know an, an external um, graphics as well although not all models are enabled for that I actually have one of the MSX models that does allow that. It's a Pioneer, um, I think it's a PX5, I think is the model number. It actually has an external video in, and so you can actually have another video signal and then overlay everything over the top. So that's your bottom layer. Then you've got your backdrop plane, which is sort of like your, um, your border color, and you can actually control that color. Then you have your your pattern plane which is your the tiles which is what we covered in the last episode we showed how you can use um, tile shapes to um, you know draw the background of your scene and then on top of that you actually have 32 sprites in the order you see so sprite 0 is on top and then 1 2 3 4 so if you put them all on top of each other you would see sprite 0 um, now the it would be wonderful if it could display all 32 sprites in one line uh, but it can't the processor is only has so much time so once it's drawn the first four sprites in priority order it just doesn't draw the rest which is why you get flickering and sprites disappearing um, right, so let's go to our next section Now I said this is the guide. I said I'm 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 following through the guide I have written. Um, so this is downloadable with the rest of the content. Now sprites can either be eight by eight pixels or they can also be sixteen by sixteen pixels. Plus you can put the sprites in a different mode. Now this applies to all the sprites. You can't have they've all got to be magnified or not. So you can either have eight by eight pixels magnified. So that means every pixel is twice the size. And um, oh, the Let's fix that as we go. Or well, 16 by 16 pixels magnified. So here we go. We have a little Wizard of War character here. Now he is actually. Now this is another thing. Sprites can actually only be one color. So if you want two colors, you need to put two sprites over the top of each other. So this is a a um, a, uh, a capture from my sprite editing tool, uh, which is also freely available for everybody to use, and it shows the sprite at normal shape and at double size as well. Um, so here's where I talk about uh, the sprites disappearing. So as you can see there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's an 8 by 8 square and if you put 4 of them together you get 16 by 16. So a 16 by 16 actually requires 1, 2, 3, 4 patterns. Um, but it's okay you actually have an entire set of patterns to use um, for your sprites. And they don't take up a lot of room because they are only one colour. Um, but each sprite can be a different colour and it doesn't matter what colour the sprites are compared to the background they won't cause um, background graphic clash they go completely over the top of the background so you can actually use sprites uh, mixed with background graphics to display more colours um, now my example libraries which I've included all the way along they do a special trick with the sprites what they do is in the first frame it draws the sprites as normal from zero to 30 to sprite 31 so that's all 32 sprites now the next frame it draws them in reverse order and what this basically allows is that you can get twice as many sprites in the line because the human eye really cannot tell the difference um, with the sprites flickering at 30 frames a second 
So that's our little trick that allows us to do more sprites. And it allows us to, you know, use more sprites without worrying about the flickering so much. Um, and without worrying about it all, just just using the libraries that I've got in there. And careful design of your sprites if you want to do multicolored sprites. Like so, say this one, it probably wouldn't really matter if the um, Wizard of War guy his gun disappeared. Um, so you could actually change that. So this one was a much lower number sprite, and his body was a higher sprite. So it, it would appear on the screen in priority over other things. So having your secondary color flicker more than the other color is a good strategy to um, be able to display more sprites on the screen but also use a lot of color. Now, how do we use our sprites? So each we have a sprite um, position table. So it has four bytes. The first byte has the Y position of the sprite, which can be from 0 to 255. Um, there is a little exception. If you set any sprite's Y coordinate up to 209, it actually makes that sprite disappear. Now, also, we note that the screen is only 192 pixels tall, so there is a period of time when the sprite will be completely off the screen. Uh, our second byte is our X position, so it's positioned from left to right, across this way, or Y is up and down. Byte number three is our pattern number, so we can have up to 256 patterns. Um, now, if you've got 16 by 16 sprites, that pattern refers to the first, the position of this pattern here, then the other three patterns need to follow on in order. So this would be the next pattern after the one you specify, the next one, and then the next one. Um, so you can overlap them with clever stuff as well. And that is a lot of patterns, so you've got a lot to go around. And then your final byte actually does the colour of the sprite. Now zeros no, wouldn't be any good because that makes it transparent, but it's a way of making a sprite disappear for a little while. You just change the colour to transparent, but otherwise you've got from 1 to 15 to um, show the sprite colour. Now, rather than, now obviously these, th these two things we've just mentioned are all in video memory. To make it easy to program my games, what I do is I have a in RAM table of 80 uh, of 128 bytes that does our sprite pattern table. Um, and every vertical refresh, we have a routine that copies that to video memory, and then that also handles that reversing the copying, you know, drawing the sprites every second frame as well. So all you have to worry about is adjusting things in normal memory and the routine looks after updating the sprites on screen which makes things much much easier. And that's actually what we've been using in our game so far, those routines. Now, let's do a bit of a demo. Um, so I've made some um, sprite patterns um, So here's our, my sprite editing tool. Just open that one. So here's our sprite pattern. Now I've got four different patterns, and if you notice, the it's got a rotating sequence. So it's trying to do TMS exclamation mark. So it's doing by alternating through a few different patterns. We're going to get a bit of animation. So there are our patterns there, the sprite file is there, as well as the um, the code that that actually generates as well. So I'll just shut that. So the actual data for that, if you, uh, if you want, you can go and open the sprite file and save um, the output as assembly, and it will actually output this data down below. So this is our data here. But what we're going to do is we're going to get our, our code here. So this is our start code, um, and then we're going to, in our patterns here, we're going to get our data, and pop it in there. Um, oops. In my, you've got to actually name your sprites if you don't. Uh, you get that little bit of an issue there. So there we go. Um, oh. Just make that neat. Okay, so we've got four sprite patterns. What I'll do is I'll put my 
I don't need to work through the document anymore. I'll just put that out of there, out of the way. Right now, we need to load our sprite patterns in. So if we have a look at our, our original code here, we go through. Uh, we've got all our screens set up, setting up our timers and our interrupt, and set um, randomizing our numbers there. Um, and we have load the character set from before. Um, now we're going to add a new routine, so come down here. So load char set there. Let's go and load our sprite shapes in. Okay, so this is a routine called load sprites. All that does is it points to our sprite uh, data table. This in memory is pointing to our first sprite pattern, so sprite one there. Um, this is the number of sprites and times 32, that's the number of bytes, so that's 8 times 4 because each of them take up um, 4 tiles because we're using 16 by 16 sprites and then we call our load um, into video RAM thing there. So we need to update our sprite count, at the moment it's 1, let's make that 4 because we've got 4 of those large shapes. Now we need to call the routine as well. So after the load character set, we need to pop in our load sprites. Like so. All it does is call that at the same time we're setting up our character set. Now we could run that at the moment, but that wouldn't do anything different from before. So um, the easiest way, to, and we're going to put all 32 sprites on screen. So we're going to add another little routine. So let's go down here, uh, just before our load one here. I'm going to pop a little routine. Right, so this one's called place sprites. Place our sprites on the screen. So we have a sprite placement table, which is down here. And our sprite table, so that's our in-memory copy of the sprite table. And then the number of ones we want to do. Okay, um, 32 times 4. I just realised I haven't actually pasted in the whole table. I have to excuse me for a second. Oh, okay, we don't have the page. Here we go. There we go, that looks a little better. So for each one of our sprites, this is the Y position. That's the X position. This is the pattern we want to use, and this is the color. So as you can see, we're working through our colors one at a time, so they're all going to be different colors. And this pattern, so you can play with this afterwards and change the position, is sort of going to be in a bit of a circle. And we go all the way through and, and around. So that very simple routine is just copying this out of our ROM into our RAM that shows where all the sprites are positioned. Now. Um, we need to actually put our sprites on the screen. So let's go to an appropriate place. So this is our title screen. We've loaded the sprites here. Now all we have to do is call that new routine. Um, and you can see here this is where we're setting up our tiles that are on the screen. Doesn't matter what order we do this in. So let's call our place sprites. Okay, now moment of truth. Let's run this. So build. Oops, I have a typing mistake. What have I done? 80. Okay, not it's an actual typing mistake in the original. I'll fix that for you guys. There we go. We've got that. Now we fire up our emulator. I've already got that pointing to the right place. So if we fire that up, get an MSX boot. And there we go. We have lots of sprites on the screen. Now some of them are going to be more difficult to see than the others because of the colours. Um, and I can't point with my graphics pointer. But you can see very, very close. There's a green one on the top right there. You can also see um, in the middle, you can see, you should be able to see a little bit of flickering depending on the capture um, I like capturing this rate as well. Um, but as you can see there's quite a few sprites on screen and 
you can see them all. Now some of them, if you look really closely, are slightly flickering. But when a game's in full motion, you won't notice that as much. Just at the moment, they're all stationary. So we'll stop there. So next thing, that's, not, that's I suppose interesting, but let's make them move. Okay. Um, now we just want it now down here. So this is our splash title here. Rather than at the moment we've got a half second timer, let's change that to a quarter second timer. Um, and in here, so in here, this code will be called every one quarter of a second. So you can play about with the timing. There's a tick timer as well. Um, right, so I'll just grab this bit of code and then we'll go through it. So we're going to put this in here, okay? So animate our sprite shapes. So we have a little animation table here, which I will put in in a minute. We have a counter, we set that to zero. We have a variable called animation step. Now we need to remember to make that yet. We haven't actually uh, allowed memory for that yet. Um, we get that and we store that in C for the moment. We set B to zero, so that means B, C only contains what's in C. We add that to HL, which is our point into our animation table. So that's going to adjust our offset into that table. And then we get the value that's in that particular section of the animation table. If it's 255, that's our marker to say we've reached the end of the, um, the table. So if it's not that, we jump further down. But if it is that, we've reached the end of our animation table, we need to set A back to zero, store that back into our animation step. And we just go and get the very first um, item in the animation table and then we continue so we'll, in, in A is our animation step that we're after which is really um, animating our sprite shape uh, so we go and pointing at the very first of our sprites and its shape and we're going to go through this loop 32 times all we do is we go and store A in that position. So that's going to, because all of the sprites are the same shape, remember? So what we're going to go through is change all 32 sprites so they are the next shape in our sequence. And then we make HL four times bigger because each sprite takes up four bytes. So we're going to one, two, three, four. And then we use our lovely decrement jump when non-zero and that'll go around this loop 32 times because it, it decrements B each time and we'll go around it 32 times and set 32 sprites to that value. Then of course we need to get our animation step and increment the value to the next one. Okay, now we need an animation table which we've, we've used, we better put that in. So here we go, let's put your animation table. What this animation table is saying, to start with it's going to make the sprite shape, the shape pattern starting at 0, then it's going to make it the shape pattern starting at 4, and then 8, then 12, and then it's going to be the end of the table. So remember we had four sprite shape patterns. So that's the first one, that's the second one, that's the third one, and that's the fourth one. So over uh, every quarter of a second it's going to change the shape of the sprite to the next sequence that we've got set. Now we did, we had a little bit of, um, uh, we had our RAM that we needed to do. So our animation step, we need to go down here. And declare their space and where's our remember anything we add to our RAM table we really should put it in our initialization section so we want that animation step to be zero so let's add it here Okay, so our init RAM is stored at the start, so we make sure that we're going to animation step is always going to have zero. Otherwise, if you ran this, it could, it could potentially have any random number in there which could mess things up. Especially since, remember, our animation table is only uh, five bytes long. So if that came in and it was randomly number 50, you'd be reading um, a random piece of memory that's after those variables. So we don't want to do that. Okay, so we should actually have some workable code now. Let's build. That's okay. So we go back to our emulator. Now hopefully as long as I've got that right, we should see our sprites and they should animate their patterns. So as you can see, you can see our TMS exclamation mark rotating in a little like ball shape. 
So that's pretty cool. So that's sprite animation. All right, we'll stop that. Now, that's still boring. Let's go and make the move. Um, so what we're going to do a little uh, sprite velocity thing here. So go to the end again, and we'll add in some more RAM. So a sprite velocity table. Uh, we won't bother initialising this one because we're going to make write a routine to do that. So we're uh, after our place sprites here. That's our sprite placement. Well, there's our animation. Let's put it before place sprites. We have a little routine to set the velocity of all of our sprites. This is a little bit more complicated than the last routine. Right, so set velocity. So we've got our sprite velocity table, which we just declared the RAM for. Um, we've got 32 sprites. So for each one we go through, we call our random number function. Um, and we do a bit of a bit mask here, so that gets it down to um, uh, numbers uh, from 0 to 8. Uh, we make sure that if we get a 0 that it's at least 1, otherwise a sprite won't be moving in one of the two directions. Um, uh, we do a test of the highest bit. Um, and because if, you, um, if the highest bit is set that makes it a negative uh, velocity because uh, it's going to subtract instead of add because uh, our numbers are only from 0 to 255 uh, we just save that value just in case so our original random number we saved in C uh, the one in A we've already done a bit mass so this bit's not going to be set regardless so we need to test the um, the C at, um, the C um, the C field instead of the um, register. Sorry, my brain. Um, so because we, we saved it in in the C register, that's the one we need to check the bit of. So bit number seven is your bit very on the left, which will indicate whether it's a negative number. So if it's zero, it's a positive one. We don't want to do anything. Um, now if it is negative we want to get the value that we had from 0 to 7 and subtract it from 255 and um, store that as the value we're going to use instead of that one so that way we're going to get sprites that go um, up and down depending on our random value now this next section is exactly the same thing but for our x values so we go through exactly the same code now, our random numbers at the moment uh, that we're using, you, you could, this is another area you can play about with. You can make, you know, you could add one more bit here if you wanted them to move a bit faster because this value is going to be how much we're going to adjust their X and Y values by every time we go around a tick. And you'll see them moving at different speeds when we run this. Um, and that's the end of our loop, so that's going to go around the number of times we have in B. So decrement B and jump if non-zero. ZA is really, really handy with the instructions it has. And return. So hopefully I haven't confused too much. I, I feel like I was a little bit all over the place for explaining that one. All right, now find our um, where we place our sc sprites on the screen. So here it is here. And then we're going to call our set velocity. Okay, so at the moment all we've done is filled some memory with some velocity values. The sprites are still not being moved. So now we need to add another routine that has a look at those velocities and actually does something. So let's go back down to set after set velocity. Let's put another routine called move sprites. So move our sprites based on the velocity. So we start our pointer pointing at the start of the sprite table and DE at the start of our velocity table B is the number of sprites, so it's going to be the number of times we go through our loop. So we get the first value out of our sprite velocity table. Um, we put it in our C register. Um, we get the value out of our sprite table, so that'll be the, the Y out of our sprite table. We add C to it. Now if C is uh, a really large number, so larger than 128, it's actually going to make the value of a decrease is going to subtract from it because it'll it'll 
uh, go all the way around because these are only 8-bit values. Then we save it back into our sprite table. So in that this little section here, we have adjusted y by the velocity that's in the first section of the sprite table. Then we increment our HL pointer and our DE pointer. So now HL is pointing to our X uh, value and DE is pointing to our second velocity. So now we do exactly the same thing um, for our X value and store that back in. We increment our HL to the next position, which is actually pointing to the pattern uh, of the sprite. We increment our D, that'll put us to our next sprite velocity table for our next sprite. So we need to increment our HL two more times to get past the pattern and the color and get back around to the Y value of the next sprite. Then we decrement our B value and jump around. So that'll go around this loop 32 times and it'll update the X and Y positions of the sprites. Now there's a little thing that we're not paying attention here. You do actually do need to make sure that sprites don't get set to um, 208 because it actually makes all sprites on screen disappear. Um, and sending them to 209 for a temporary period of time when they go off screen isn't going to matter. So you will see occasionally when a sprite happens to get its Y coordinate set to 208, all the sprites will disappear off the screen for a second. So there does actually need to be a little bit more logic in um, in this routine to skip those particular values of y, but we won't worry about that at the moment. Okay, now we need to move our sprite. So we've got our move routine, but we need to call it. So after our little, the last part of our, remember it's just after our quarter second timer here, we've got animating our shape, and we're updating an animation step. So now we need to call our move sprites. So let's grab that, pop that there. Okay, now hopefully, as long as we've done everything right, let's build, bring up our emulator. Get our MSX logo. And now our sprites are moving. I wouldn't say their the randomness is particularly good, but they are moving, and there is obviously a little bit of flickering going on. But um, and there's there we go. We just got a whole flash when one of the sprites was set to 208. Um, you can see most of them uh, at all times. There are you know little bits of flickering, but in, in a game you're not really going to notice that um, because majority of the time they're um, they're you can still see at least an outline of them. So there we go, we've uh, had a good play with sprites. Um, so feel free to play with the code and adjust it, uh, maybe work out a, a different randomizer for the um, moving routine. Also it would be nice to add a little bit of extra logic in there so it never set a sprite value to 208. Um, and you need to be careful about that because obviously you need to determine whether you're adding or subtracting to make sure that you adjust it one way or the other. Um, but other than that, that's the end of our TMS section of our learning. Um, next time we're going to do a little bit of a side lesson on creating sound. Now with the um, two systems, the Spectre Video and the MSX have the same sound chip, but the ColecoVision does not. Uh, the ColecoVision has, shares the same sound chip as does the SG1000, SG, SC3000 um, and I believe the Memotech MTX shares that one as well so there's two different uh, sound chip types they are similar but they are controlled a little different so um, our next episode will cover the sound on both systems but probably be a bit longer because we need to do just cover the slight differences between the two but we'll just do a general lesson on s making sounds and we'll just concentrate on sound effects for the time being and then the next episode of that will add some sound effects to our games, get some zaps and explosions going. Alright, I hope everybody out there is enjoying the Let's Make a Retro Game series. I actually really enjoy working uh, on these. And now all of the support materials for this episode will be up on my website, link down below. So that's all of the starting code for Spectre Video, Coleco and MSX and ending code. Um, plus obviously the, the sprite editor file, you've got the sprite editor which is freely downloadable and the actual entire article with all of the things that I've talked about today is also downloadable as one document. Alright, I'm Electric Adventures, thanks to all my subscribers, thanks for watching and I'll catch you next time.